Uh, good morning. Uh, everybody can hear us and see us. This is uh, Craig Davidson, President of Taurus Agricultural Marketing. Welcome to, uh, I guess this would be our third podcast and uh, podcast in the spring. Um, we always, you know, hopefully learn from the last. We're getting to a point where we're actually starting to enjoy these conversations that we actually have you know on a daily basis instead of tourists and and as we spread our wings uh you know we we've uh done some different things and actually today we have a uh a guest with us uh, craig aldi from the peace region and uh, so yeah we're actually getting outside of our comfort zone with our own internal group and and uh, bringing in a, a grower and a customer and and a, a very diversified operation with aldi farms and uh, uh broken uh what is it greg broken broken pine, pine orchard orchard yeah. yeah you bet so i'll maybe to start i'll actually uh, introduce craig aldi uh and this is a, a unique opportunity too for you those watching you got two craigs and one one show here it's like two diamonds in the rough doesn't happen too often you can find uh <laughs> two, two, two craigs in one setting but uh so yeah craig if you want to just maybe introduce yourself that'd be uh that'd be great sure uh, thanks for having me here. First of all, um, I should be out spraying this morning, but <laughs> got pulled in. It's a beautiful, uh, almost summerish day out, so it, it's great that we're seeing the crops advance quite a bit. Uh, I farm about 2,300 acres, give or take. We're a family operation. We farm out in Rio Grande, Alberta. It's basically on the west side where they shouldn't have cleared trees. Um, and we were stuck with the homestead way out there. So yep. it, we, uh, our soil is a gray wooded soil and it's, uh, it's heavy clay based. We only have about six inches of topsoil in most areas. So we conventional farm canola, wheat, barley, um, a few grasses the odd time. And then we diversified in 2010 uh, into hascap berries. And so we planted 20,000 plants on the actually original homestead land, the original 35 acres that my great grandfather cleared. Okay, wow. How long have you been doing the ASCAPs? But 2010 is when we planted. Um, okay. Takes a while for the plants to mature. They, uh, it takes about four years before you can commercially harvest them with a harvester. And so we're, we're, sit, we're into that now. Um, we've been learning as we go with the, harvesting and with the processing and obviously with pollination and with fertilization when we first started growing hascap berries there was a lot of unknowns it was out of the university of saskatchewan and we were told i uh, don't use poly or anything to keep weeds out don't fertilize you don't need irrigation all that was wrong and so you know that's what happens when it comes out of initial research is essentially the farmers got to learn on their own and we've done that and so there's a big growers group now and we've learned a lot with the berries um we also know they don't like getting their feet wet so we should have installed tile drainage uh, in low areas so we've learned a lot with them um i would say that the, the berry has a lot of promise with uh throw canada because of its growing conditions it loves cool weather it loves to flower early it can take about minus five frost on the flower, which is really unique. Um, the difficulties with it is that it flowers really early. So bees, especially honeybees, are a little bit, I'll call it lazy in cool conditions. They like it warmer. And the picture you can see showing is a bumblebee. And we are blessed to have edges throughout the field and we grow rocks in our country so there's rock piles all over the place and and bumblebees love nesting in those and so we try to strive for uh, longer flowering and also to make sure those bumbles are out in full force so on an every every given day you have about two bumblebees per plant and so if you have 20,000 plants that's a lot of bees mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that's uh hard to visualize but yeah that's a lot of bees flying around uh, doing their thing there yeah if you're, there's if, a, if you're afraid of bees you don't want to be out there and flowering 
<laughs> <laughs> I'd be no good. I'd be no good. I'd be a the armor if it was me. No. Um, we already have a quick question just before we get on to introducing uh, our other two uh, folks here. Um, any uh, issues with domestic honeybees impacting natural pollinators? Do you see that in your orchard, Craig? Or? Sure, I can talk on that. We uh, huh? are also lucky enough to work with a, a local apiarist, and we have had two communities of honeybees on the orchard and there's been no impact at all as far as with the, uh, I would say the native bees, the bumblebees. Um, the honey production has never dropped and we've never seen a drop with the bumblebees as well. So they seem like they coexist quite nicely. Um, we even have a huge population of yellow jackets. Um, they're a bit of a nuisance when you're trying to pick berries and you get close to one that's in the ground. Um, but they, they're good at keeping actually pests away. So they're, uh, they're a blessing and they're also a bit of a curse when you have people trying to pick and they're getting chased around by yellow jackets. So <laughs> all the bees seem like they coexist quite nicely. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's good. So they can work, they can work together to achieve pollination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Right on. Well, thanks for the introduction. And, and once again, you know, thanks for coming on this morning. Uh, as we all know, across Western Canada, you know, every every spring seems to have its own set of circumstance and challenge. And, you know, I mean, there's there's growers still trying to wrap up seeding if they can or, or you know, actually just saying enough's enough. And I know there's still some harvest to do from 2019. And, and yet, as you say, you should be in the sprayer this morning because we've had, it seems like 40 days of wind and Spray mm -hmm. days are precious to spray the crop that we have that's ready. So, so we appreciate you being here for for the next hour, and and uh, we'll get you out here and on the sprayer as quick as, quick as we can. <laughs> so, uh, uh, above me and my, we got Mike Delinsky, our uh, in-house plant physiologist. Mike, uh, if you want to say a few words, but uh, Mike's our in-house expert. We're going to talk about the intricacies of uh, of reproduction here today, and and Mike. Uh, Nobody has a closer look than what Mike's done under a microscope. So, thanks, Greg. Yeah, I won't say much right now, uh, but uh, I'll be ready to answer any questions. I just want to point out that because of time and so on, if you want to really learn about this stuff in detail, go to Taurus's website. I've done uh, several webinars, uh, 45 to an hour long, on both canola and peas and reproduction. Uh, so, you know, we'll cover a minor amount, but uh, I'll go over in detail how this process all takes place. So go there after this if you're really interested in learning about uh, how plants reproduce. Um, that's correct. Okay. And then we got Brett Gein up here as well from the Peace Region, our manager that covers the millions of acres in the Peace. So uh, this is Brett's first uh, podcast. So welcome, Brett. Thanks for coming on. And yeah, if you want to just introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, yeah, I'm Brett Gwyneth. I've been, I lived in Sexsmith now for over 20 years and worked all through the peace country in a lot of different uh, capacities. But uh, yeah, I've known the area quite well. So this is, this is going to be home for a long, long time yet to come. <laughs> That's what they say. Once you go there, you never want to leave. It's a beautiful place on this <laughs> earth. So it's, uh, yeah. Other than it, it sounds like it rains quite a bit there at times. So. <laughs> Just the last few years. Yeah. 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 And the winter's long. <laughs> and the winter's long. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could come to Manitoba and say the same thing. Seems like they're long here too. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah, you know what, today, again, we just, kind of the idea of these podcasts is, you know, we have all these great conversations internally. We kind of said, let's expose this to a broader audience and elicit conversation and thoughts and, and maybe some questions that, that people have on their minds. And, and so today, you know, we're, you know, obviously spring has spread out across Western Canada and it has been a challenge, but as we get through this phase of, of, uh, you know, these early plants and, and trying to keep our fields clean and, and keep the, the, the plants healthy. You know, we have to start thinking about the, the phase that's coming, you know, in the, in the coming days and weeks. And that is, 
is reproduction. And, uh, you know, we do everything we can to make these strong, vibrant, healthy plants that are setting up strong, aggressive, progressive rooting systems that are forming relationships with soil biology uh, to help access and, and, and build, you know, nutrition into these plants. And then all of a sudden, we get to this phase, and it seems like it happens on us very quickly, uh, that we have to move into a phase of reproduction. And so these plants that spend all this time building a factory, now it's got to say, well, let's, 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 let's move on to this phase where what it's all about. And that's actually setting seed or in the case of Craig's orchard, you know, building, building that fruit or building that berry. And, and yet I, I would say for us, it's, I mean, we're, we're passionate about it. Uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to learn about it and yet it's in a broader audience perspective i think reproduction uh is is still relatively unknown how important it is or how critical or finicky it can be when it comes to a plant or or any living being i mean everything on this earth you know we could say goes through a reproductive phase and when we talk about plants it's uh you know they they have to deal with the environment that they're in as well so it's uh you know, as good a job as we can do up front, uh, when we get to that reproductive phase, it's still the environment that may may throw throw us some curveballs that uh, that can present some challenges. So, so our conversation here today is really about obviously flowering crops, the pollination or reproduction process, and and then really how does that actually involve other aspects of of nature? And, and Greg's already brought it up you know, in, in the orchard about how important bee foraging is, you know, as far as pollination of the Hascap berry. And and I think when we look at our broad-based crops, I mean, let's be honest, when we think about flowering, we think about what we visually see, and that's that's a flower. But, you know, I'll ask the question to Brett, you know, how many how many acres of flowering crops do we have here in Western Canada? <laughs> Yeah, quite a few million, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a loaded question, Brad. It's a loaded question. <laughs> well, by the time you add up, I mean, we got our, you got peas and your canola and our flax and your hascap berries, which is actually quite a growing market, too. But we're, I don't think there's a farmer out there that isn't dealing with flowering crops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I'm setting you up here a little bit, but when you think about it, every plant we grow, everything we grow is a flowers. flowering crop. Yeah, yeah. it flowers. Mm-hmm. We don't, and that's why I say we're vi- we're visual people. So your mindset mm-hmm. and my mindset, you say a flowering crop, first thing you think of is what? Canola. And you say, well, peas, they flower and lentils, they flower. We don't necessarily see the flowers, but even things like oats and barley and wheat and flax and every single crop we grow flowers flowers, goes through a reproductive phase and that is a critical phase of any plant's life and so yes immediately we can say half the acres we don't even think about them as flowering crops because we actually don't actually see them go through that process if you think of a wheat head we don't really think well it's, it's a wheat head and it's got wheat kernels and it's done its thing but there is a time when it's critical when that wheat head is, is trying to reproduce and and uh and it's it's like i'll go to i'll go to mike here now and michael you know years ago he he came up with this this mindset of sex and wheat and and you know this reproductive phase is essentially that right it's 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 a wheat head making love to itself or i'm not sure how you'd want to explain it but it's uh it's going through a phase of actually you know making baby Baby seedlings. Okay. Am I off off track yeah. here, Mike? Or no, you're, 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 you're right. You don't see them flowering because they flower right in the florets. Uh, but right. the, you know the principle is all the same though across whatever flower, whether it be in wheat or in canola or whatever. Uh, it's just the way it is. The pollen has to transfer from the anthers to the stigma to bring about fertilization because we have two processes involved. One is pollination followed by actually fertilization so pollination basically means that the the pollen grain gets to 
the stigma. I don't know if you you can't see my arrow, can you? When I'm pointing on my screen, I don't know if you uh, have your arrow there, Craig, to show. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So you get yeah. your uh, pollen grain landing, and then it's got to grow up, take its nuclear material and match it with the female material which are in these seeds. And this represents either a canola plant or or a, or a pea plant or or any of those kind of um, potted plants. And then it grows a pollen tube down and it transfers its nuclear material, its male material, onto the stigma. For example, here's canola, and you can see here's the anther open up, and these are all pollen grains. And when you look at the stigma, you can see all these pollen grains right there. Next one, Craig. And you can see they're dry and they, they go on to there. So here's a pollen grain that is sitting uh, up and I, I blew it up there because you can see that it actually was pushed up from the surface of the stigma because it's growing a pollen tube down. You can also see, if you look at it in this top left one, when you look at the stigma, it's all covered in liquid. Basically, when the pollen grain gets there, it has to be hydrated, pop open a little capsule, and allow the pollen tube out. And the bottom right photograph shows those lines. You can see all the pollen on that stigma, and you can see that the pollen tubes have grown down the style into pollinate the seeds. And that's what takes place. If the pollen tube doesn't get to the ovule, then you don't get pollination. Uh, please go back to the first one for just a second, the diagram. Uh, can you go back? Yeah. Because that's the first part, just getting the pollen tube there and then and then growing down. And I just want to cover it for our one more back to the right. There we go. So when the pollen tube, and you can see that purple line coming in there, and you can see that we have the, the seam. Oops. I'll have it back for have, you. We, we have the sperm there. So that moves down and it goes into the ovule and it combines with the ovule to actually form a viable seed. If that doesn't happen, that seed is aborted. It will not happen. As soon as it does happen, though, uh, it closes that micropile to prevent any other one. Just like when a person or an animal gets poll uh, pollinated, gets fertilized, uh, the, the ovule prevents the entry of any more sperm, so to speak, in that animal. The plant is really no different than that. And that then starts the process of growing that seed. If it doesn't get that, then it will abort, and that's where we get blanks in yeah. the pot. So, so a pollen the tube has to grow down to every one of these seeds. And just like yeah. corn, they have to grow to every one of those seeds. Yeah. So in the mm -hmm. case of in the case of cereals, you know, essentially say wheat or barley, this is all happening inside of the inside of the actual grain head you're not actually visualizing this like you would on a like a canola flower or a, where you can actually see the you can see the uh the stigma right with the yes. when the the blossom the answers sitting there right yeah uh, in, in wheat that all happens within the floret and then you know it's pollinated when you see the anther has been extruded from from the floret then you know uh, because that's the empty uh, empty stamen or anther. Yeah. So when we talk about, and I guess, and I'll maybe go to Craig here, you know, when, when, and maybe, you know, you, you it's, you're kind of, a, you're interesting to me as a grower in a sense that when we talk about the importance of reproduction and, and how intricate pollination is, you're kind of looking at it as, as, as a, a fruit or berry grower and you, and you know mm -hmm. how important getting berry set is and then you say well i'm also growing canola and i'm also growing you know mm -hmm. things like peas or whatever or wheat are you more aware now as as a berry grower because you know how important that pollination process is for those has, has kept berries yeah it's actually quite unique in in that i've learned a lot since we have planted Haskat berries. And I think it's been enhanced in the fact that pollination is so key. And the more pollen, the better. Uh, to me, it's it, that's your key, is you want to have 
an unbelievable pollen set and produce pollen for as long as you can to make sure we don't have blanks, whether it be in berries or canola or wheat. And we've noticed, especially in, in canola, um, that our blanks have been almost eliminated with proper fertilization. And, and so I look at the full spectrum. And so what's helped with the Hascat berries is when I first met Brett um, with Active Flower and started talking about pollination and the importance of it and that it's cold. So I got to have, you know, longer time pollinating and more pollen. And it kind of grew into, well, what about the other crops? And so we started looking at everything else and it's expanded into making sure that the proper macros are in place and then the micros to make sure that you have the uh, uh, perfect pollination for your plants. And so for me, it's all about uh, timing as well as getting through those stress periods. It seems like every crop sees stress period at least four times a year. I wish that wasn't the case, but that is the fact. And so the, the better your plant can make it through those stress times and make sure it's there for reproduction, it's like it's the perfect Friday night. <laughs> and so yep. everything happens perfectly and you may still have a decent set even though your crop um, isn't optimum. And we used to have, you go to a, I'll say a canola field, you go to it, it looks beautiful in flower, and all of a sudden you see blasting going on where the flowers are dropping, and you notice at the end that there's no pods forming. And whether it be heat or lack of rain, all those things, that gets more and more enhanced without proper uh, fertilization. And so what we've found with, whether it be prime, build, flower, all these really help to tag on to your fertilization program. And so for us, it's bumped our yields. I, I would say about 10% our yields have been bumped with the use of, of your products. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that little plug there, Craig. That's, uh, you know, but I, one thing that stuck to me that you just said proper fertilization you know and we we keep referring to this in our businesses you gotta you gotta build this factory and you gotta have the nutrition there in place to actually make this all work and yet we can do all these things right and yet and this is where you know mike is so adamant that we still have to to, to manage the stresses that come our way in in the production of of, of food or in the or, or in the process of growing strong vibrant plants and and yet none of that can happen without optimized fertility programs and mm -hmm. you know I'll, I'll argue that i mean you know we call ourselves farmers or we call ourselves growers but if we're growing plants actually nutrition does not stop from the day you put a seed in the ground it's actually focusing on plant health all the way through right right even into this reproductive phase and so I'll go to Brett and, you know, when, when we look at your region, you know, obviously we're talking millions of acres and, and millions of acres of what we would call the visual flowering crops like canola and peas. What would you consider some of the stresses that you would face as you enter this reproductive phase, even with your optimal fertility programs? Because I know you're working with, with some of the best growers in the area, including including Craig. Well, I think right. Well, we've had to deal with the last few years. It's just uh, it's been too. It's not really been really warm, so that we've had cooler temperatures, and then we've had a lot of rain, and it's been wet, and then we haven't had that optimal time for that pollen to to be spread around. Uh, it can go all directions, though. I mean, we've had lots of years where it's been too hot and dry, where pollen's been drying out, and you've had half your plant in the middle of that flowering time is just blank, there's not even any pods. So trying to make sure that your your plant actually has the energy and the nutrients to actually make the pollen is, is kind of a tough thing for guys up here because we don't usually have it where it's ideal. It's usually on one end of the spectrum about way too <laughs> hot and dry or it's on the other where we're too cold and wet and we're dealing with like 14 degrees and raining instead of uh, instead of a nice warm temperatures right yeah so any uh yeah you know what it's funny i mean um 
I'm in southern Manitoba, and, and honestly, for our area, it's probably when you get to the start of July or into July, you know, our greater concern is we can have, you know, days that get into the 30s, and and even with with the best programs, you know, most most growers that is that is one of the greatest concerns. Is geez, I hope it, I hope the weatherman isn't right that they're calling for a extreme heat when we get to you know our, our canola is going to be flowering next week and and you talk to growers that are now into corn or you go into the midwest u.s where corn is is uh, even you watch the weather in the midwest u.s and they'll always talk about the concern of a heat wave coming when when that corn crop is is going into pollination because they, they just know that, that that could have a, a severe impact on 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 how well you know those plants end up producing yield and and maybe Mike you can talk to this as but what actually if we talk about the stress here what are we actually seeing if we talk about you know and this is where it gets really complex because we say well we got we got these anthers and we got these stigmas and we got pollen and we got ovaries and but what actually happens here like where would we actually lose the conductivity of this this flower actually turning into into a pod, or in the case of Craig's orchard, this flower actually turning into a into a berry? Well, the the trick is is that all through the growing life cycle of the plant, you have the risk of having the pollination affected. For, I'll give you a start out a little back. You know, when you see a, a bud, the actual bud in the bud cluster of a canola plant, the stigma and the anthers are already there. They are produced right at the beginning and that the plant has to mature though. So, so it's not as though this happens in any given time. And on top of that, you have canola, which is somewhat an inde indeterminate bloomer. So it's got, you know, uh, blossoms, or you got pods and blossoms at the same time. So that plant over a long period of time is pollinating and reproducing, and it's got to feed the pollen. The pollen has to be matured. Now, heat stress itself is more damaging to the viability of the pollen typically than it is to the actual ovary because the ovary has a lot of transpiration that takes place to it. It's a fairly large organism, uh, organ. Anthers don't. They're fed by that little tiny filament, so it's hard to actually get nutrient and sustain the anther. So extreme heat and drought can cause the reduction in pollen way, way back during the growing period because it's multiplying all the way from the time the bud is formed. Now, when it gets to the pollination period, the amount of nutrient in the tip of the stigma as shown here is key because if that is not saturated with the so-called juices that are needed to germinate that pollen grain, it's not receptive to pollination, the flower will not be pollinated. So under drought conditions, you can have lack of moisture and transpiration and actually secretions there that allow the pollen grain to, to even germinate. So there's a ton of things that can happen throughout that, that, that period uh, from, in fact, drought and heat are probably the two worst one, nutrient deficiencies, and we'll cover that a, a little bit at the end, are the other ones but for me it's all about the stress management and, okay. and that's what your nutrients do for you mm -hmm. yeah so when we, when we talk about it's kind of funny because we and i when i talk about growers you're talking to me that's the connect conductivity to actually the focus on plant health and really the focus on plant health is actually trying to figure out how to mitigate some of these stresses that come into a plant's life. Is what kind of what you're referring to, Mike? Totally, totally. You know, when we got that yeah. big growth curve and, and we we got to manage those stresses all the way till we get to reproduction. Right. And then yeah. we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, yeah. So I, I wrote down a few just when we talk about stresses, even with a plant that's optimized from a fertility in the soil mindset, I mean, like we said, there's things like heat stress, and that, that's directly correlated to pollen maturity and pollen viability. Even the stigma, if that mucus or mucogel isn't, isn't hydrated to actually grab onto the pollen, then it, it can't actually build a pollen tube. I mean, 
maybe I'll ask that. What is a pollen tube? <laughs> what, what is a pollen tube? Well, the pollen tube is is uh, if we go back to that first diagram, it 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 basically shows that the pollen. And I'll I'll make a comment about the pollen tube because it you know. Uh, Right back to the diagram. Yeah, I know it takes a while. the po The pollen tube is right here. So, so from here, it has to grow this tube. And and I should point out, there's only two single cell or uh, organs in the in the in the plant. One is the root hair, and the other one is the pollen tube. This is one cell. So the cell has to actually feed itself because this pollen grain isn't enough to feed the growth of a pollen tube. For example, all the way here. If it had to pollinate this ovule right at the bottom of the of the pod, Craig, you 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 have to get your uh, your your arrow going here because I'm moving my arrow, but I can't oh. see yours. Uh, so so to do that, it has to feed all along here, and then when it gets here, this is the pollen tube coming down. So it's transferring the male, the sperm, into the ovary, just like well. An, an animal does it in a similar way, so to speak. It yeah. moves it into it. So that's the pollen tube. And it grows. And I, I want to make one comment that's important because of for guys everywhere about our product, uh, Sulfur Plus, because the driving force behind the growth and the direction of the pollen tube is calcium. Uh, calcium is critical to the growth of the pollen tube because the pollen tube, as it grows, have to have cell structure, and calcium is key in both the direction and the formation of the pollen tube. That's a pollen tube. So if you think of that, that pollen falling on the stigma, the stigma is sticky, so it, it accepts it. Right. Now that pollen has to basically make a tube. Right. So where does all that energy come from? That's inside of the pollen grain. No, no, it, it, it actually feeds, it absorbs nutrients from the style as it grows through it. Okay. Okay, so, so that's why that, the, the style and the whole thing has to be filled with nutrients. Remember, we were just going to take those tissue samples. We're going to take the top three inches or so of that pollen of that uh, canola plant to see how much nutrient it, there is in there. It has to feed as it grows. Okay. So it's actually inside uh, now inside inside the stigma. Stigma inside the yeah. stigma. It's actually absorbing nutrients, nutrition, or energy to keep that pollen tube growing. That's right, and it's moving it in the vacuole, and the vacuole moves down the pollen tube, and it feeds the growth of that pollen tube, and the pH and the calcium are involved in directing it when it enters here through the micropile. Actually, a uh, a uh, uh, amino acid called GABA, uh, which is, is, controls the direction of the pollen tube into the micropile in order to do that. So the plant actually directs that pollen tube so it can get there. And that's done hormonally largely and through all kinds of signals. Okay. Yeah, it's really so cool. And it happens in all plants. Yeah. yeah and the but unique thing not... with uh, Coscat berries is with it, it takes two flowers to make one berry. So an actual okay. berry has two ovules in it. And so if you don't get proper pollination, what happens is you may get actually a deformed berry where the skin doesn't close around the two different ovules. So uh -huh. pollination is even more enhanced where it actually needs another plant to pollinate it as well. It doesn't pollinate itself. It needs another plant that is slightly different. And so that enhanced pollination is really key. Okay. But uh, I'll ask this question. I mean, there's, there's, and we've had this question over the years as we, you know, get more into these deeper conversations about, about this whole reproductive phase. What, what crops do we have that, and Greg, Craig's kind of alluding to it here, but like open pollinated plants versus mm -hmm. closed pollinated plants, what, what would those be? I, I'm going to throw that out here to the group. Somebody wants to answer it. <laughs> Let Mike answer. He's yeah. the expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go go back what to that to those anthers. Oops. Oops. Go, that's okay. Back one. Because you know, wheat, for example, it pollinated within the stigma. 
Okay, right there. So take take yeah. a look at this. This this is sitting. The flower, the petals are here. So this pollen is floating around and landing on the same on its species. Eh? So this is what I would consider. We don't call them open pollinating canola plants anymore. But to me, it's it can be pollinated by another plant beside it because it's the same 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 species. Eh? But you take okay. a legume, for example, a legume. It's it's within the keel of the plant, so the the bumble the bee is sort of necessary to open it, and then you get the pollen that the bee moves around. And I I really right offhand don't don't know if it can be pollinated uh, by itself. Whereas the wheat kernel, uh, the stigma the anthers open up just like that, and then the pollen uh, is largely dehydrated before uh, it becomes like this because the the anther has to feed it. That pollen has to be fed all through its growing season, so it's attached to the outside of the anther, then it's dried and released from the side of the anther, and then comes out and goes onto the tip there. So bees can do this. I see a lot of thrips feeding in those flowers, and they're carrying pollen, and the wind can do it. Mm -hmm. All of those can do, can do that. Wheat, not so much. Not so much. Once the the uh, uh, if if a wheat kernel isn't pollinated, it'll stay open for a while, try to capture some pollen, but really doesn't. Okay. Uh, so, so all yeah. your legumes are are sort of uh, largely uh, they're cross pollinated uh, by insects primarily. Yeah. <clears throat> so your your legumes like peas and uh, lentils. lentils and faba beans and chickpeas, they they. They they do require this symbiotic relationship with a with a like a bee to actually help get some of this pollen moved around even within the flower, like the same flower, or from that flower to another flower. To another flower, and that's what yeah. uh, Alex Uh To tell you the honest truth, I don't uh, haven't a thought about it, but I don't really know if it can pollinate without that. I know up in in Canada we can't. Use bumble, uh, honeybees for pollination of alfalfa very efficiently, and that's why we do use leaf cutter bees. And without bees, you don't get pollination of alfalfa. Our house gaps would be very little too. Bees are key. Bees are key. So open, uh, they would be considered more of an open pollinated or cross pollinated type of plant. Than, cross, yeah, yeah. 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 That's that's why with, with canola. Even though we get some results, we get pollination of canola without bees. No okay. doubt, it, it just enhances it, but it's not the key reason you get uh, pollination. Because take a look at all this pollen that's around there. It's just you know when you go in the field, you can come back with your pants covered yellow. That pollen is exposed out in the open. Yeah. I think fescue is unique in the fact if you ever see a fescue field, which is unique to the peace country, especially on a windy day and in later june here you'll see it looks like dust blowing across and that's the pollen so wind is the primary for fescue yeah well actually one of our you know when we i'm going back like eight nine years for us you know one of our first exposures to this whole pollination and the critical aspect of pollination when it actually involves a living being like a like a bee uh, was our, our work with Active Agri when they were actually looking to, uh, along with UBC, to actually develop and create a, a solution that actually helped with bee foraging activity. And that was kind of the, the, the advent of back then a product called Pollinate. But what they did at that time is they actually measured uh, bee foraging activity. And this was on, this was on blueberries. And, and what they found is, and you know the product today is called active flower but they they found that they could actually increase bee activity and, and they were focused on kind of what mike went through is is around the alleviating the stresses enhancing the overall reproductive phase with nutrition and ensuring that there was the pollen was viable and and you know i show you this chart here but this is early day stuff where they're saying geez you know what they they increased bee foraging activity by call it on average 50%. There was 50% more bee visits to one bush within one hour period where they actually had applied this complex 
of you know polyamines and a nutritional package uh, onto these these blueberry bushes or in your case craig onto like a, a hazcap bush and, and they actually said it it actually it it, it enhanced the, the amount of bees coming to those bushes within an hour's period um yeah that, so, it, it makes sense because i mean the bee is after food and so if you have an area that has the best quality food that's where you're gonna go yeah so when you say it like that it sounds like it's too simple, right? It's just like it's uh, think think like a bee. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Think like a bee. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pull up to the buffet where there's more food. There's you know what what are they what are, what is a bee actually looking for? Might be a stupid question. I don't know what what's a bee looking for. Well, they're looking for pollen. That's what they're looking pollen. for. Pollen. They want the pollen. They want the pollen a- and nectar. Yeah, and, and nectar. nectar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they really go after it. If you ever watch a, a honeybee compared to a, a bumblebee, a honeybee really works over a flower. Inside, outside, they'll go around it. And sometimes for a longer period of time, and the more pollen they have or nectar, they'll be on it longer. Bumblebees, kind of like they have ADD. They hit a berry, they hit a berry, hit a berry, and so they move all the time. And I don't know if they are so worried about um food or they don't know which food they like <laughs> they they seem like they skip flowers probably five times faster than what a, a honeybee does and so that's why they're such great pollinators they they are your key for us when it's cold and not nice outside bumblebees are the key just just for okay. curiosity because i used to be in the bee industry uh a bumble uh, the bees collect the pollen as a side effect of of nectar because they're hairy Correct. and 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 it gathers on their hairs and then they have combs and comb it on to their back legs so they can carry it so it actually causes the pollination by accident Correct. because it's after the nectar and the pollen is all over itself and the the, the stigma is sticky so it just just moved by accident because it's yeah. also collecting pollen to go take it back to the hive to feed the young. Yeah. 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 So the That's nectar. Amazing. Yeah. The nectar is actually in the, 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 you know, the stigma. There, there are nectaries, uh, you know, I knew you were going to ask that question, but I don't know. <laughs> it's that, but there are nectaries. Because it takes that long proboscis and it shoves it down. I think they're at the base of the of the stigma, and they they mm-hmm. take that and and suck out the nectar, so they're bumbling around. But bumblebees are big and they're fast and they're fast. Mm-hmm. They're they're pretty efficient. Yeah, the, the piece that would make sense. Notorious for that. Yeah, the the nectar in a sense is actually like the energy that actually provides the pollen tube to grow down to the ovary. Well, I think that could be one way to do it. That the, the nectar yeah. is the is is the energy that goes to make honey. It's sugar. So you're you're yeah. probably right in that respect. It's the carbohydrates that are produced in in photosynthesis with nutrients that is feeding everything in that plant actually. Well, okay. and it probably is wanting to enhance more pollination to attract insects. So it's kind of a secondary <laughs> too that wants to attract other insects. Yeah, yeah. pollen is what attracts every all the insects there. You're right. Yeah, After, I'll show you this this slide, and it's it's more of a reference. But I mean, we always talk about how important everything is up front to make this all happen. But if we add stresses at this stage, I mean, we can we can lose this pollen viability. We can we can lose the stickiness of the stigma, which is essentially carbohydrates or sugars. Um, mm-hmm. You know, which then we add a stress like, you know, it's too hot or it's too dry or we run out of nutrition. And now we start dropping flowers or those flawed flowers don't turn into pods or we start mm-hmm. to lose some seed set within a pod. Uh, and then and then we got to finish it. We got to finish it. So which still requires our factory. It requires all this energy, which is, is filling seeds. Well, what, what is if I said there's one nutrient that's critical to actually move all this around? And fill those seeds, Brett. What would you what would you say as a nutrient that's critical at the reproductive phase to finishing a crop? What what nutrient would uh, you? I think boron is a is a pretty key nutrient at this time. 
Yep. But your uh, your FOSS is a good one. You have, it has to have enough FOSS in it too because it needs the energy, and your FOSS is your is your whole energy source too. But you I think boron is a is a pretty key one. Yeah. So if we say boron, and, and I'll I'll bring this up. I mean, I, I could say in my time in this business over the last 24, 25 years. If there is one nutrient, when we talk about flowering crops, what do people want to spray? They want to spray boron, right? Why do, why do they want to spray boron? Like what, what's so exciting about just boron? Mike, why would you say boron has been the one that everybody wants to, to use? Well, it's, it's, it's highly uh, considered important in terms of growth of the pollen tube. Uh, like I said, the okay. the, pol the pollen tube. Uh, but I, I'm a big fan of potassium. Uh, potassium uh, going into the pollination period frequently is short because uh, the soil test showed there's lots of potassium, but under dry conditions, it's all trapped in the, between the lattices of the clay, and the plant can't get it. So there's quite a frequent when you look at tissue testing over uh, many years uh, when I was uh, my former job. Uh, we always saw deficiencies of potassium going into, into pollination time. You know? And I think one thing, and I, I would agree with you, I mean, that's one, because I say, yes, we all talk about boron, and it's it's critical if you're saying pollen tube growth, uh, you know, making sure that that tube gets all the way down to the ovary to get seed set, that's the fertilization piece. Yep. But if we don't have potassium, you know, once a plant once a plant goes reproductive, all that energy that would be normally going to grow roots, most of that energy then gets redirected to filling filling the grain or the grain kernels. And potassium as a nutrient is key for translocating that energy in the plant. Well, at that stage, if we're not growing really any more roots or root development, the energy is is diverted somewhere else. We better have a lot of potassium built into that plant. There better be a lot of potassium already into the structure or body of that plant, and if it's a little bit short, then where where does that potassium come from, right? And that that could be a limiting nutrient. And it's, you know, we don't think of potassium as short in Western Canada, and yet, you know, I I, I watched a presentation or seen some data on some a conglomerate of tissue tests done last year or two years ago, and and at this reproductive phase, one of the most limiting nutrients in 200 crops tested was was yes. potassium right so you say well geez that you know it's pretty much at a one-to-one -one ratio with all crops we grow it's important potassium to nitrogen and yet if it's running short and we're not growing a whole lot more roots once plants go reproductive where, where does it come from just just to point out we, we have it we 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 have even a worse problem with boron because potassium at least is mobile in the plant so it can move it from lower leaves up with boron boron isn't so by the time the roots are starting to shut down going into pollination period the plant has n no real ability to move the nutrients it has stored earlier up into that reproductive part so if we're if we're not getting moisture to keep that transpiration going and moving boron the plant can't move it around so you know it's it's tied in with with potassium but at least potassium if you load the plant up early you can move it it'll move it within within the plant the other problem with with the pollen tube is i mentioned calcium and calcium similar calcium is locked up in the tissue so if you're dry and you're not getting transpiration root uptake the plant cannot reallocate calcium very easily from old leaves up into the new new uh, into the seeds because that's yeah. usually later on in the season so so those become really really tough on the plant well i think that's a pretty key thing for a lot of growers up in this area because there isn't a lot of soil samples that you can look up up here where your potassium levels and your calcium levels are where they should be at yeah mm -hmm. you got low ph soils up there yeah so but potassium it's funny with you calcium Sorry, with you guys all talking, it's interesting that it just brings the importance of that full fertilizer program. Mm -hmm. It really does. There's not one particular thing you use the silver bullet. It's that perfect blend at the right timing. Yeah. So in your gray wooded soils, Craig, 
you know, you, you're obviously putting on potash in your in your fertility program. Yeah, we uh, we've really changed our fertility program with our regular cropping, um, just to enhance, especially our FOSS levels. Um, our cooler soils the last few years, our FOSS movement up to the plant we know has been low. We were lucky last year if our soil temp got to 15 degrees, and so you really seen that with late maturing plants, yeah. they just didn't want to end, and so yeah. it, we've really tried to move to now with uh, crystal green and trying to make sure that there's more FOSS that's available to the plant. Um, but that's, once again, it's just one one component. So our our mix, they almost dread when I pull up to the fertilizer plant. <laughs> so they, know, they know it's going to take them a while to blend it. <laughs> yeah. And you're seeing, Brett, you're seeing in your region with the uh, <clears throat> lower pH calcium too, as Mike alluded to, you're seeing quite a, a, a gravitation or movement to actually adding calcium into into the fertility programs as well. Yeah, it's been actually a, a big growth thing for us up here is a lot more guys are recognizing that and trying to add that in. So. Mm -hmm. yep. so yeah, the nice thing question. is with the uh, sulfur plus with the calcium in it as well. And just so people know ease of use, it doesn't build up moisture. So if you're having spouts and tubes, everything building, blocking off because all the moisture, Sulfur Plus doesn't. So that's a great, great system. Um, and and I guess a side bonus for anyone that wants to use it. Yeah, yeah it's a unique product and we're excited to have it here in our marketplace for sure. Um, just with all the properties it can, can bring as far as calcium and nutrition and slow feeding sulf sulfate and uh, seed safety and all those things right so um yeah just a quick comment on the sulfur plus you know we talk about calcium but sulfur is one of the key nutrients for all plants to deal with stress in terms of the way it handles and some of the byproducts it makes out of sulfur compounds primarily one called glutathione, which is key in terms of dealing with uh, what we in humans call free radicals that are produced in plants under stress. I mean, plants aren't much different than us. In fact, if you think of it, we get all our nutrients from plants or from the animals that eat plants. So uh, we're, we're pretty close to each other. And, uh, and it helps us with a, a lot of our stress management, actually, too, those same compounds. Yeah. So I show a couple pictures here, obviously. I mean, in our world, we're focused right from the beginning all the way through a plant's life. We talk about plant health, but yet, you know what? I mean, we've all seen this. We've seen missing, missing pods on the main stem. We've seen blanks of seed within within a pod, and it, it just it happens. And sometimes there's not much we can do about it, honestly. You just say, you know, the environment, the environment is there that it just makes it really tough on a plant, even with everything we try to do up front that you just end up you know you just end up losing some flowers that don't become pods or uh, you know and i think there's some statistics out there some some plants have a little more challenge with reproduction than others and you know there's thoughts that so, like a soybean plant which you probably don't have as many now in the piece but it's uh you know they they can they have trouble setting 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 pods you know a lot of the flowers they produce just never end up being being a pod and in, in drier years we see here I've seen in Manitoba that you know we have optimal growing conditions with good moisture you'll end up with pods with, with three or four beans and then dry years the two beans you know what happened why did it go from four to two well it just that something happened the stigma it didn't accept the pollen the pollen dried out the pollen tube didn't get to the ovary uh, and 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 it, or it ran out of nutrients it ran out of nutrients and it could only make use of, of two ovaries out of, out of five because uh, that's all that energy was there for, for that pod set. So it's so, so intricate and so critical. And yet and that's why we're having this podcast today. Cause I don't know if we really all understand how important it is and how many pieces go into getting it just to this stage to get, to make a successful reproductive phase of a plant's life. So yeah, and it's happen. interesting to see, Mike, and maybe you can comment on it, but 
of how far back when it starts forming that yield potential, right? So all those ovaries are in place and ready because if you've got a little short pods, well, it doesn't matter if they're all full if you're already 50%. Right, right. Uh, you know, you lose a lot of flowers in canola, man, uh, a, a, a lot of flowers. And I, w I want to make an interesting point. Uh, the maximum yield potential we have with the crop is when you put the seed in the ground. And most everything we do from fertility to how we deal with compaction and all those things is to protect that yield potential. The plant will grow the potential. That's its genetic makeup. It'll grow that potential. But as the plant goes through each stress event and has to make decisions about where to allocate nutrients, because the shoot and the root are always communicating, one has to build with the other one. When it runs out of carbohydrates, sugars that is producing in photosynthesis, it's got to do something. So it kills off ovules, it kills off pods, it kills off cells over a long period of time. And, you know, we get to the end where we get our 60 bushel canola, and yet the canola plant produces at least a 200 bushel yield potential per acre. So throughout this, we're protecting it because we can't make any more yield. The plant is going to make it all. We're protecting the loss of that yield in, in the largest sense. Uh, I don't think I necessarily got to your, your question, but I think if we're going to end soon, I want to go to this last slide. I think it's the last one uh, because it's, it sort of explains everything. And this is famous stuff out of Marshner's book, who's the, sort of the father of plant physiology. But the one thing is, when we look at the key nutrients, and there's calcium, copper, manganese, zinc, and boron. Those are sort of key in some senses. And you look at the uptake or need during vegetation versus reproductive, you can see all the things we're talking about. Boron levels go sky high. Pollen tube, oxygens, and sugars zinc and all kinds of enzymes and so on, manganese as well, copper, and look at calcium. Calcium demand goes up in reproduction. Now, the key points are copper, manganese, and zinc are key nutrients in stress management for those, those free uh, radicals that I always talk about, the boron and the calcium from pollen tube growth. So, these are basically the nutrients we put into products to support pollination it's not just sort of well let's try this and this and this it's all based on the science related to reproduction that's sort of our my key message uh, and we have other things here in polyamines that are in it but take take a look at the nutrients in here in fact we have iron which is the one that is really also key with uh, uh, in terms of dealing with stress and we have the pot pot potassium or potash that we wanted to have in there to move nutrients going into the flowering period, along with a little P, a little bit of nitrogen to support amino acid production and energy. That's why the package is put together that way. If you want to, we're getting close to our, our time here, but if you want to just take a minute and talk about what you've researched on polyamines, Mike, and, and the impact of polyamines around this this phase of, of pollen, pollen hydration, um, pollen sustainability? Well, you know, polyamines are, are a hormone in plants. They're, they're typical in, in plants, but hardly anybody even talks about them. Uh, when you look at polyamines, it's made up of, of several carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen-based cations. So they're positively charged. And, and they are involved in stress management hydration of pollen, uh, movement of nutrients uh, up into the stigmas. Uh, in fact, it's amazing uh, through most of my career, which wasn't always related to agriculture, but more to entomology, I never hear anybody talking about polyamines, but when you start reading about them, they're amazing both in plants and in human beings for dealing with disease management and largely abiotic and biotic stress. Uh, I can't go into all the details, but if you just look up polyamines on internet uh, in terms of role in plants, you'll be amazed at, at, at what, they, what they do. So we do install them, and there's one precursor that sort of makes all the rest. It's called putrescine, and it then forms all the other ones in terms of biosynthesizing. 
And I want to just make one point. You know, a plant grows by taking water and nutrients and CO2 from the air and sunshine. And that's it. So everything that is produced, every hormone, every enzyme is synthesized by genetics in the plant. But if we don't provide those key nutrients, we interfere with getting that 250 bushel yield. And it's a very difficult situation in an environment like Canada. Yeah, yeah, I would say we have <laughs> we have 100 days, right? We have 100 days, and this is a thousand piece puzzle. Mm-hmm. You say, wow, that, that, this makes this farming thing or growing plants way more intricate than sometimes we give it credit. And that's why, you know, we always appreciate when we have growers like Craig that, yeah. that, that want to, want to learn more and they want to, they want to understand the whys behind the house. And, and when you can in, uh, intertwine a, a whole nother uh, crop or, or program, like growing hascap berries, then you, you learn more. You say, well, geez, what I learned in my hascaps, can I adopt that over onto my, my canola and peas? And that and that's how we started. We took something that we were learning on blueberry production in the lower mainland of BC, and we brought that to Western Canada. So, geez, if we could if we could focus on reproduction and 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 the importance of pollen pollination of a flower, can we actually have that same focus on on a plant like a pea plant or like a, a canola plant or a, a lentil plant? And and I would say, you know, over the years. We have seen that success. We have seen that focus actually turn into, um, you know, I guess we'd like to say retaining more of that potential that, like, like Mike says, the plant started out with. If we did everything right and, and had the progressive fertility program, and in the case of, you know, Craig now using Crystal Green and using things like Sulfur Plus, and we built the factory. Now it's up to us to try to manage plant health, mitigate these stresses, keep pollen hydrated and healthy, make sure that pollen tube gets to the ovary, turn more of these flowers into pods or, or berries. And, uh, and that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's a holistic approach to a bunch of little things, trying to do a bunch of little things right. It's not just one thing. And, and when we talk about flower that we've had for years, it's not about flour. I mean, flour is, I got a thousand pieces in my puzzle. It's one of those pieces that we can use to, to figure out how this all fits together. And, and Mike's, Mike's our, our plant physiologist and he, and he, and he understands the stresses that, that human beings and animals and insects and plants go through. This is one way to try to manage or mitigate some of those stresses that, that come our way. Yeah, and, and, and timing is, is, is sort of everything when we're going at this. One of the difficulties, we might as well talk about the difficulties. You know, today we're not going to go across the field very readily uh, uh, to put on a foliar application. We're going to blend it in with a herbicide or a fungicide time. And one of right. the, 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 the problems, uh, I guess it, it is, is if we're going to go in, for, for example, with sclerotinia timing, we're going at 30, 40% bloom. And we're going to put flower in at that time. Well, we're not going to catch every flower because we've already got maybe some pod set early. So we're going to catch the later part of that flowering period, which may be the 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 time it needs it most because it's getting dry and late. So nothing is perfect. We have to just make do with the logistics to to make this happen. And and these provide those those key nutrients at critical times. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Oh, Brett, if you, uh, maybe just a bit, your experience with flour over the last few years in the Peace region, obviously you're putting it on canola and peas. Um, what have you seen as far as the usage and acceptance? Um, I think timing is pretty key on it when guys actually spray. And if guys don't spray it at the right time, they don't see the results that they want to see. But for the most part, when we can get sprayed, uh, at the right time and get it on those on those flowers early, then uh, the plants uh, seem to do a whole lot better. We are seeing less length. Uh, yields are obviously affected positively. And guys have been pretty impressed. Um, 
the use of handling is very simple. It mixes well with uh, with most of the fungicides. I haven't had any issues with it mixing with any, and it's been it's been very well accepted in most areas. So. Okay. Yeah, if you want the, any of that information, obviously on our website, or we can get you compatibilities and, and mixing instructions and things like that. Um, so yeah, and and you know it's been around for eight or nine years, uh, and and yet we're still learning. We're doing this because we're still learning about the importance of reproduction. We're still learning about how intricate this phase of a plant's life is, and I think we all, you know, when we pull back the curtains, there's a lot of things we don't know. And every time you ask a question, you learn something, but you probably, it probably creates another question in your mind. And that's what it's all about for us. And, and so for today, you know, we were grateful that Greg's taken uh, his, his, his butt out of the sprayer seat to be here for an hour and, and give us his experiences. And, uh, you know, that, that's for us. I mean, we, we are learning as much from growers like Craig and what he's doing on his farm and his operation as we try to learn internally, because it's, where the rubber hits the road is is what you're trying to achieve and that's that's success in your orchard or success on an acre of land and you know right now we're keeping you from spraying barley uh, probably with with some active build in it and you know we're, you're doing that because you believe in plant health you want to keep that barley actively growing and moving forward and uh you know we're there with you i mean we're we're learning along the way but um so our conversation today, we're, we're glad that you could join us. And if you got any closing comments, Craig, before yeah, you I think, get back to the prayer. Yeah, I think the only closing is for us. I mean, whether you'd be looking for another pound of berries per plant or whether you're looking for another percent protein in wheat or five bushel yield in canola, each one of those little intricacies, there's somewhere in your program, I think, that you can find a product that will fit or several. And for us, we try to every year take the soil samples and do um, some sort of enhancement to achieve a goal that we're after too, like Mike said, to reach, to reach that potential that that plant has always wanted. And so for us, we just continue to learn as well and try, I'm not afraid to, to try anything new. Okay. Well, that's great. And that's the attitude. I think that's the attitude that we all have to have is blinders off, you know, because this isn't easy. This is not easy. It's because we're dealing with mother nature and we're dealing with short growing seasons and, and, and yet we're moving the bar. The bar is moving because we see it in my life in this industry. The bar has moved a lot. You might not see it from year to year, but over the course of years, you say we have moved the bar a long, long ways. Mm -hmm which tells us there's still lots of opportunity in, in front of us, but we can't, we can't take our foot off the gas or, or put the blinders back on. We got to keep the blinders, the blinders off. So I see you got a question so that, there. I got a question. Yeah. yeah. The question is uh, highest ROI timing for spraying canola and wheat. Uh, if we're looking at, Something like active flower, Brett, what would you say most of your growers are trying to go as early as possible? We go as early as possible. Basically, as soon as you see can see a flower out there, you know, that, that 5% flowering is when we try mm -hmm. to hit it. And that's where you're going to get it. If you're getting into that, you know, 40% flower, you, you don't see the results that you want to see usually. So we try to we try to go early and we'll mix the fungicide rate with it. And that's where you're gonna get the best results is when you're going early. Which could what be a fit it? with some of these new chemistries or like Morales, which maybe gives us a little earlier window um, to go. And Mike would say if that plant has that flower's done, there's nothing we can do with it. It's done and it's either made a pot or it didn't. Okay. So the the earlier the better. At that point in time, you're just helping, you know, for, for a short period of time with some nutrients to to help it out, uh, you know, filling the pot as best you can. But you know, to me, just just remember that 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 pollen and those ovules and everything are growing long before it blooms. So uh, I I wouldn't be afraid to go at at just before pre bloom because it takes a little time for that to work into the the molecules of those organelles and those organs 
So it's not going to be you spray today and it's all done tomorrow. It's going to take a little time to move that in there, even though it's close to it. So as early as possible, and you know, logistics seems to always <laughs> trump agronomy. It seems <laughs> but that's yeah. our hundred day period. <clears throat> Yeah, and we would say with a product like flour, you know, we expect 10 to 14 days of activity, like Mike said. So in that window, those are probably all your main main stem pods on something like canola, and those are probably your greatest yeah. pods that contribute to yield. So, yeah. yeah. So with that, I think we'll wrap it up. As always, if I'm the one leading the charge, I always go over time. So we appreciate you sticking around for a few extra minutes because the conversation's been great, and, and we're... Uh, Glad that Greg's been able to join us. I'll put a little plug in for him. If you're looking for uh, a case of wine, look up Broken Tine Orchard. They have some excellent product there and, and I can attest to it myself. I've sampled it and it, it is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I think you got, you got a website too, Craig, that we could, uh, yep, we could access. Do. What is that? Yeah. It's Broken Tine Orchard. So that's okay. okay. Just, Simple yeah, and anytime that. you guys want to come out, do field tours, or anyone wants to come out and see the crops or the orchard, uh, give me a call. We've got a nice cabin on the orchard, tasting cabin, as well as we'll host tours. So you want to come out and talk canola, we'll talk canola, wheat, barley, ask <laughs> you name it. Sounds right up my alley. I can do it all <laughs> and drink some wine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we do it over wine. That's right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining, and uh, thanks for everybody for being a part of the panel here today. Have thanks. a good rest of the spring season and uh, rest of the season in front of us. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Thanks.